CFC is now embarking on a new discipleship program, right? We are all aware of that. But this time, it's not the usual program that many churches, including CFC, have been doing. You see, before, in fact, until now in many churches, many of the discipleship programs are lecture-based. So what they do is they gather believers, they make them sit, they have booklets, and the teacher teaches them. It's more of a transfer of knowledge from one person to another. It's more of addressing the intellect, educating them, informing them of what they should believe and what they should know. Now, actually, that's also a part of discipleship, but that's not all of it. The problem is many churches, including CFC, have been focusing on this alone. That's why we were not really able to produce quality disciples because we are not doing it right. And so we have uh, decided that we're going to overhaul our discipleship program. And this time, instead of using a lecture-based program, we're going to use life-on-life discipleship. Everybody say life-on-life discipleship. Life-on-life discipleship is not so much a lecture-based program. In life-on-life discipleship, we have a discipler or disciple-maker, okay, taking care of a few people. And then he lives his life before them. He shows them how to live. He also teaches them what to believe, okay? But not just teaching them what to believe, not just a transfer of knowledge from one mind to another, but showing to them how to live as a Christian, how to serve as a Christian, bringing them as he ministers, taking care of them, spending time with them, taking them as apprentice disciples, and making sure that they really live their lives as Christians, and they do the discipleship task or the great commission that we have received from the Lord. That is life-on-life discipleship. Now, at the start of this uh, new discipleship program in our church, our pastors were just thinking about doing this program in our congregation. So we were imagining, oh, for sure, through this program, we'll be able to raise more quality disciples who will also make disciples, right? And we were excited and we were thinking, for sure, CFC is going to grow in quantity by leaps and bounds. However, the more we study the Word of God and the more we think and uh, pray about how to promote discipleship in our church, we realize that we should not be fulfilling the Great Commission only in our city, but to the end of the earth, Right? This is actually our mandate from God. Look at me in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. It says here, And Jesus came and said to them, uh, This happened shortly before the Lord Jesus Christ went back to heaven. So he gave them or left them uh, with a few important words. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all what? Nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our mandate is not only to preach the gospel and train people back home or here in our city, in our province, in our country, but to the end of the earth. Take it to the nations. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the what? End of the earth. There goes our complete mandate. Not just here in our little city, Not just here in our province, not just here in our country, but to the end of the earth. Therefore, CFC or our church must fulfill God's mandate not only locally, but also globally. So right from the start, we are going to stress both side by side. While we are zealously fulfilling the Great Commission here in our city, 
we are also going to zealously, enthusiastically fulfill the Great Commission outside. We will cross borders. We will enter cultures so we can do both. Now, I understand many people would usually think, and this is how I used to think, oh, Pastor Rich, can we not first strengthen our church here before we go out? We still have so many things to do here. That's how I thought before. Listen to this. The work here will never be done. You will always have something to do here. Believe me. I've been in the ministry full-time for the last 20 years. And that was my usual tune. Let's first do it here. And after the people are already established, strengthened, and we have already done our work here, then we will go out. What happened? Until now, we're still here. And while we are sitting here and thinking what we're doing here and the work here, even our own personal lives, guess what? Thousands of people, millions of people are dying there without hearing the gospel even once in their lifetime. That's the fact. Okay? How many people do you have in the world right now? Over 7 billion, right? According to statistics, one-third of that have not heard the gospel preach even once. How will people be saved from hell if they don't, if they haven't even heard the gospel even once? According to World Fact Book, around 150,000 people die every day. That's a lot, right? 150,000. Guess what? 50,000 of them haven't heard the gospel even once. So what are we going to do? Wait for another year or two? Before we move, before we send missionaries, what? There's no way that old paradigm is going to work. We have to stress both. On the one hand, we work hard here. We rise up, we join the work. On the other hand, we go out and we save people as many as we can. Of course, the Lord will not uh, hold us accountable for things that we cannot do. But for things that we can do, I tell you, He will hold us responsible. So we ask the Lord for empowerment. We ask the Lord to touch our hearts. And when He touches our hearts, we rise up. Amen? We cannot be complacent about this. We cannot. And as your senior pastor, I will not allow that to happen. No more. Spanish, no mas. We are going to submit ourselves to God and trust ourselves to God, our ministries, and we will be obedient to the Lord. Now, in order to help us understand God's complete mandate for us, we are going to begin a series today on the Great Commission. And basically, we are going to use the uh, um, sermon uh, seminar material of Accelerating International Mission Strategies, or aims, and this seminar material is entitled Harvest Connections. So for the next uh, eight weeks, Pastor Hilmer Payden and I are going to take turns preaching on this, okay, so that we will really be educated on the complete mandate of God for us, which is the Great Commission. Now, for this series of study, our objectives are the following. Number one, understand God's passion to finish His Mission. Number two, integrate your life with God's mission. Number three, perceive the current state of God's mission. And number four, learn what an Acts 1 8 church looks like. And number five, discover the eight best practices of churches engaged in missions. Now, for starters, let me share with you today the four essential steps that we should take if we must fulfill the Great Commission. Number one, connect your purpose to God's vision and passion. Again, connect your purpose to God's vision and passion. Each one of us here has a passion, right? What's your passion? Maybe your vision and passion in life is to become rich. That's why you spend most of your time, your energy, resources to try to look for ways to earn more and more money, right? That's a passion. That's a vision. 
Perhaps your vision is to become an excellent educator. So you keep on studying. You study one degree after another. You already have a doctorate. Now you want to have another doctorate. Okay? Because that's your vision and passion. And still others have their vision and passion in the field of sports. So they, they train hard every year. They look for uh, advanced ways of training so that they just excel and excel in their field of sports. How about God? What is the vision and passion of God? What is it that God is really so concerned to the point that He made the greatest sacrifice, which is sending His one and only Son? Isn't it that when we have a vision and passion in our life, whatever it is, we are willing to sacrifice, right? What did you sacrifice for your career? What did you sacrifice for your ambition? We sacrifice because that is our vision and passion. It engulfs our hearts. So what is the vision and passion of God? Look at me. In Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the vision and passion of God. He wants people to be saved. Right? And that's why he was willing to make the greatest, the ultimate sacrifice. And that is the life of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. In fact, even in the Old Testament, the Lord had already, in a prophecy, showed there that his desire, his passion, is that the whole earth will be filled with his glory, with the truth about him. Look at me in Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 14. It says here, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay? So that's the vision and passion of God. He wants all people to know Him. God is a God of mission. And His passion is to see His mission finished. That is, all nations or all people groups in the world will have the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, I don't know if this is just subliminal, or perhaps it's just subliminal, but many of us live our lives and do our ministries as if the vision and passion of God is to bless us, to make us rich, to make us wealthy, it's always about us. So when we come to church, we want to be fed. We want to get. And so we, we feel we don't get what we want. We move to another church, right? We complain about the preaching. We complain about the music. We complain about the aircon. We complain about the, the songs. Hey, hey. You're not here to get. And life is not about you. Grow up. Life is about God. His vision and passion. And His vision and passion is not for you to be wealthy. It's not for you to be healthy. It's not for you to be successful, of course. If He wants to do that, He can do that. But that is not His vision and passion. That is not His greatest concern. The greatest concern of God is first, His glory. Second is that many people, if not all people in this world, will hear the, hear the gospel. What are we doing? Now, here's the thing. Based on God's plan, the church is to be the agent to fulfill His vision and passion. Do you realize that? He could have chosen angels to preach the gospel, and yet, in God's grand scheme of things, he has chosen to use us, the church corporately, and us as individual believers. It is our responsibility. This responsibility falls on our lap. The question is this, though. Are the purposes of our congregation and the congregations of other Christians there, as reflected in our ministries, connected to the vision and passion of God? 
Who among you here are a member of some ministries here or fellowship groups in this church? Raise your hands. Okay. Who else about here? You are a member of some ministries here, the fellowship groups. Question. You ask yourself. You evaluate your fellowship groups. You evaluate your, your ministries. Are what you are doing there connected to the vision and passion of God? Think about that. We say we have little time, we have little resources. Why not focus our little time, little resources on the vision and passion of God that He has entrusted to us? What are you studying in your Bible study groups? What are you doing there? Of course, we love uh, sermons and Bible studies that are self-help in nature. I want to know how to be happy. I want to know how to da da da. It's always about my happiness, my benefit. Hey, grow up. When are we going to desire to know God's will, how to do ministry so that we can really fulfill the vision and passion of God? Here at CFC, we're not growing spiritual babies forever. We want you to be mature. So are the purposes of our congregation as reflected in our ministries connected to the vision and passion of God? Or let us make it more personal. Are what you are doing in your life, whatever it is, connected to the fulfillment of the Great Commission? How are you using your time, your abilities, your energy, your material resources? Are you using them all? in connection to the vision and passion of God that is to save lost souls and to de- train them in His way so that they will be able to reach to more souls and to train them? Now, you might say to me, but pastor, I have a job. I have families to take care of. Good for you, Pastor Rich. You are full-time in the ministry. How about me, Pastor. I have a work to do. I have families to take care of. Not to mention my hobbies. My interests. You know what? Actually, there's no real problem. You just think there's a problem. Actually, there's no problem. All you have to do is to change the purpose why you're doing that into the vision and passion of God. And intentionally do it. You can still take care of your family. Of course, you take care of your family. You can still work. Of course, you have to work. That is the will of God. You can still engage in your hobbies. You can still engage your interests. But make sure that this time, you are going to change the purpose why you are doing them into the purpose of God. His vision and passion, which is to reach out to lost souls and disciple them for Jesus Christ. For example, if you are an employee, continue to work. Don't say, oh, the Lord is coming soon. I will stop working. I will sell everything. I will just do the ministry. No. Who knows when the Lord will come? Right? So continue working. But do this. As you are working, intentionally make sure that you are living a good life, a good testimony before your colleagues at work. If you have the opportunity, share the gospel with them. The people you come in contact every day, lead them to the Lord. When you do that, actually, you're not only doing your job, but you are connecting your purpose to the vision and passion of God wherever you are. Okay? Look at me. In Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says here, slaves, okay, or employees, are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, meaning don't steal at work, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That's what will happen. If we are intentional about this and we live for God, we share the gospel, at work we can still fulfill the great commission. Or perhaps you, you uh, are bis- a businessman or owner of a, a business. You can still do business, Right? 
But perhaps this time, you want to change your purpose or your goal into God's goal. And this, that is this time, you will continue to strive to earn more. You will continue to open more businesses, look for other ways to earn uh, a living. But this time, your goal is so that you will have more money to support missionaries who are willing to sacrifice their lives out there and to support the work of God here or to provide work for people so that you can bring them to the Lord. So you're still there. You still do business. You still work, right? Or maybe as you take care of your children and make sure that you are using that time to disciple them for Christ. Just don't uh, make sure that they have food to eat, that they have clothes to wear, that they go to good schools. Many times we are so busy with these things. And that's okay. Essentially, because we have to do these things. But where is discipleship there? You have to connect your purpose, what you're doing to the vision and passion of God. So make sure that as you take good care of your children, you know, disciple them. So even there, I tell you, you are still doing the work of the Lord. In fact, even in your hobbies, who among you here have hobbies that you really do? Oftentimes, raise your hands. I will not ask what. Okay. Don't be shy. I want the golfers here. Raise your hands. Okay, we have hobbies, right? Do you realize that even your hobbies that are taking so much of your time can be connected to the vision and passion of God. So you don't have to stop your hobbies. One of my hobbies, I have very few hobbies, watching news, uh, brushing up my Chinese, and reading books. And another thing is martial arts. Ever since I was in, 13, uh, was, uh, in high school, 13 years old, I was already studying martial arts. Uh, there were... Uh, highs and lows in my training because sometimes I will be very busy but in the end through the years I'm into martial arts and as a martial artist I'm very aware that it's using up so much of my time but guess what one day just God, God just gave me a vision use martial arts to reach out to the youth and that's why here at CFC we have a martial arts ministry for the last five years we have seen young people introduced to the Lord and saved and are now serving Him now they're also instructors. They are now black belts leading, teaching their fellow young people not only martial arts techniques, but more so the Word of God. Right? So that's making a hobby. You know, that's connecting a hobby to the vision and passion of God. In fact, I have been doing this uh, enthusiastically to the point that I have written a book on it. It's fresh off the, the press. Uh, entitled Youth Martial Arts Ministry, A Developmental Approach. Because I want to use my hobby, my interest to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's your hobby? Just change the purpose. Keep doing it. But change your purpose, connect it to the vision and passion of God. You see, the Great Commission is not only for pastors and missionaries. Whatever occupation you have, you should connect it to the purpose of God. That's number one. Connect your purpose to God's vision and passion. Number two, another essential uh, step that you must take is to empower believers to fulfill the Great Commission. Empower believers to fulfill the Great Commission. Commission. Now that believers have identified and connected to God's mission, we have to empower them. Or to make it more personal, now that we have identified and connected to the vision and passion of God, that is the Great Commission, we have to be empowered. That's why the Lord God has given uh, preachers and teachers of His Word to His churches. Look at me in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says here, And God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints or believers for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. You see that? The primary responsibility of preachers and teachers of the Word of God, like me, is to use the Word of God to equip 
members. For the purpose of what? For the purpose of doing the work of ministry. Or to be more specific, so that we will be able, we will be equipped to share the gospel with others and disciple them for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is this again. Are our programs, specifically our discipleship program in church, really empowering or training our members to fulfill the Great Commission? As one of the pastors of this church for the last 10 years, and the senior pastor for the last five years, I would have to say we are not really doing that. And it's shame on me. Right? Our discipleship here in church is more of lecture based. And that's why we're not able to produce quality disciples who make disciples like them. Is our Sunday school equipping the kids to fulfill the Great Commission? Are we training these young minds, uh, young souls to spread the Word of God in their own context? You see, our discipleship program should be geared to empower people with actual skills. And the best way is to uh, use the life-on-life -life discipleship program where people become our apprentices. We show to them how to live. We show to them how to minister. They just copy us. Right? So how is our program, discipleship program? How is the Sunday school program? Or do we just expect our members to automatically share the gospel with others and disciples, disciple them without really giving them practical training on how to do it? Listen to this, leaders, elders, and pastors of this church. Expectation without empowerment will lead to frustration on the part of both parties. Again, expectation without empowerment or training or equipping will lead to frustration on the part of both parties. Of course, the leaders will expect from the members. Oh, they have to share the gospel. They have to disciple. They should be very active. But in the end, if the leaders have not given them the right training, they have not equipped them or empowered them, the leaders will just be disappointed or be frustrated because those members will not be able to fulfill the expectation of the leader. On the other hand, even if members know what they are supposed to do, oh, we have to do this, the expectation of them, since they were not equipped, they themselves will be frustrated. So expectation without empowerment will lead to frustration on the part of both parties. Therefore, we have to be intentional about this. That's why we really overhauled our discipleship program. That's why here at CFC, we have a new discipleship program. And with a very pronounced goal. The goal is making disciples who make disciples. Amen? We just don't want to, to produce people who know the Word of God, who know how to serve, and not really becoming disciples themselves. We want to produce disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples to the end of the earth. So brothers and sisters, join us and be empowered. Here at CFC right now, we have around 80 members who have been tapped to be the first batch of disciple makers. All of them are also disciples on the other hand. On the one hand, they are disciple makers. They lead disciple, disciples group, groups. And yet, on the other hand, they are also disciple of someone. We have around 80 people now as first batch. And one of these days, don't be surprised, they're going to approach you. Please don't reject. Rise up. Don't say, I have no time. Da, 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 da. We're now grown up. We have a job to do. You make sacrifices just as God made sacrifices for you. That's the way to go. If you want to serve God, you want to make an impact, 
many times, if not all the time, you have to make sacrifices. Somebody, something's got to go. Right? Again, just like if you have a vision, a personal vision and passion, you are so willing to sacrifice anything for it, right? Why can't we sacrifice for God? Here in our church, my job is to uh, comfort the troubled and to trouble the comfortable. That's what I'm doing right now. Okay? So join us and be empowered. Of course, ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who is the power behind that equips and makes us effective. Listen to the word of the Lord again in Acts 1.8. He said to his disciples... Before, shortly before he went back to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That power comes from the Holy Spirit. So that's number two. Empower or be empowered to fulfill the Great Commission. Join us, rise up. Number three, another essential step that we should take if we want to fulfill the vision and passion of God is to engage in action to fulfill the Great Commission. Engage in action to fulfill the Great Commission. Now that you are equipped, let's engage, right? Let's go into action. For what's the point of connecting to the vision and passion of God and being empowered if you do nothing, right? I know someone, she was taught how to drive. But after learning how to drive, she did not put her driving skills to use until now. She continues to commute or ask her husband to bring her to places. What's the point? Any one of you here like that? <laughs> you had driving lessons before and now... Oh. <laughs> We have uh, a very honest uh, sister here, <laughs> right? Of course, barring reasonable uh, reasons, right? When we learn something, a skill, we learn it so that we can apply it. We can put it to use in the same way in Christianity. Not only are we connecting, not only are we receiving empowerment or training, now we have to engage in action, now, there are various ways and degrees of engaging or fulfilling the Great Commission. As a, a believer, a member of this church, you can share the gospel with your relatives and friends, your colleagues at work, right? You can do that in various ways. Or uh, maybe the Lord is, uh, will call you to be a pastor or a missionary. Then you can do that also full-time using various ways. Or maybe you can use a regular means of sharing the gospel, right? Straightforward sharing the gospel. Or you can employ creative means. We have very creative uh, ministries right now. We have the, here at CFC, like we have livelihood ministry. We teach people, we impart to them livelihood skills. At the same time, we also share the gospel with them and make them disciples of Jesus Christ. We also have a martial arts ministry, sports ministry. That is the, the newest uh, ministry that we have here at CFC, sports ministry. We're going to uh, use different sports to reach out to the young people. We also have a uh, feeding ministry. And many more. These are creative ways. So we see that we, there are actually various ways and various degrees of engaging or fulfilling the Great Commission. The point is this. Whatever way you employ and to whatever degree you employ it, the important thing is that you engage. You go into action. You do something. And as a church, we're already doing this to some degree, right? We use various ways, and we are engaging on two fronts, local evangelism and discipleship, and even cross-cultural evangelism, or we call it missions. We still have a long way to go, but we are already engaging ourselves on both fronts, but let me ask you this, as an individual believer, what are you doing so far? Or are you just like someone, oh, the crowd is there, they're doing this. <sighs> Present, 
I'm here. At least, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, uh, uh, but I'm here. I'm a part of this group. Oh, that is a corporate doing the work of God, right? But how about on a personal level? Are you using your time, your energy, your abilities, even your hobbies? <laughs> hobbies is really a big thing now. I understand. That's why I have to include it. Are you using these things to share the gospel? For those of you in the, the business world, are you sharing the gospel with your employees? I understand. Some of you here have Bible studies in your businesses. That's good. What do you want more? I pray that one day all the business owners here will have a Bible study in their stores, in their companies. Use that. Okay. What are you doing so far? Are you helping in any way? If you are helping in any way or contributing in any way, is that all you can do? Really? I believe many of us are underperforming as far as ministering is concerned. Brothers and sisters, don't wait or delay. Stop saying next week, next month, next year. Stop. Stop it. Please. For the last 10 years, I've been very uh, understanding to many of you. When I ask you to join a ministry, you will say, oh, Pastor Rich, I'm still busy. Actually, not only in this church, but in other churches that I pastor. Pastor Rich, I'm so busy. I have uh, this. I have that. Okay. Only for me to find out that you opened again another business. Or this time you are now become a, a board member of this uh, group. Or you have joined this uh, social club. Or you have uh, embarked on a new hobby. Please. So I told the, the pastoral team, we're not going to treat them like babies anymore. Because as we keep on trying to understand our members, we wake up the following day seeing them doing something else. Giving their time, their energy, their abilities, their knowledge, their expertise to the world's cause, different causes. Because there are so many things in the world, so many people competing for our little time, right? And I felt that the last 10 years here, I'm trying to understand you. But in the end, the ministry of the Lord is neglected. But again, that's what I told you, no more of this. No mass. We shape up, we rise up, we do the work. Amen? Amen. amen? amen. The Lord heard your amens. <laughs> Number four. Another essential step that we must do to fulfill the Great Commission is to reap a worldwide harvest of souls for the Lord. Reap a worldwide harvest of souls for the Lord. You see, we sow God's word in order to reap souls, right? After we preach the gospel, we lead unbelievers to repent from their sins and receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and then we disciple them. That is the goal of our mission. That is harvesting. Unfortunately, there are those who preach the gospel and lead people to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but do not disciple them. Of course, it's good that you share the gospel and uh, challenge them to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is, does not go far enough. You have to disciple them if you really want to complete that harvest. Okay? That's why here at CFC, we are no longer doing outreach in areas where we have no one to follow, follow them up. I still remember when I was still new here at CFC, we would do outreach here and there, we'd bring uh, goods to distribute to people, we'd have people from our church sing songs to them and uh, uh, share the gospel with them and even uh, share food and clothing and other uh, resources with them. But after that, that's all. We just left and we did not do any follow-up work. So that's why uh, not long after that, 
When I noticed it, I said, okay, here at CFC, we will no longer do any outreach work in places where we have no people to follow up them up. Okay? Because that's not enough. It's not enough to just share the gospel and lead them to Christ. We have to do follow up. There are those who just preach the gospel and do not call for decisions. Obviously, this is not harvesting. This is not reaping souls. This is just sowing. Worse yet, I don't know if you're aware of this, the trend nowadays in some Christian circles is to simply go, do good to unbelievers, helping the needy, and never sharing the gospel at all. Now, helping the needy with their needs is okay. Okay, it's fine. But never call that or never think that by doing that, you are already fulfilling the Great Commission because that is not the Great Commission. I know there's a shift even in missiology among missionaries. There's a shift of thinking. Oh, let's just bless them. Let's just distribute goods, help them build a house, a house for them. But they don't share the gospel anymore. I tell you, that is not fulfilling the Great Commission. That's why, again, here at CFC, we make sure that we really share the gospel. I still remember when I was new in CFC, I think it was in 2006, I joined this uh, medical mission. I can't remember who were, who were in charge of that. And I realized, this was in 2006, I realized that all they did was uh, treat the patients, uh, the, the medical and dental patients, distributed uh, food and medicines, and that was all. And so I was disappointed, really. And so when I came back, I talked to the pastoral team. I said, why don't we make it a policy that next time, whenever we have a medical mission, the gospel must be preached and people must be led to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, that's not great commission. The Buddhists are also doing that. The other religious groups that are non-Christian are also doing that. Even atheists and agnostics are also doing that. What's the difference? Brothers and sisters, let's make sure that after we share the gospel, we lead people to repent and receive Jesus, and we disciple them. This is really completing the work of the Great Commission, making disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who will make disciples to the end of the earth. American pastor, evangelist, by the name of uh, Dr. Kermit Long, once said these words, and I quote, With all our education, our fine buildings, our image of the church, we are doing less to win people to Christ than our unschooled or uneducated forefathers did. We are no longer fishers of men, but keepers of the aquarium. And we spend most of our time swiping fish from each other's bowl. Is that happening here? Yes. Brothers and sisters, this should not be the case with CFC. Corporately and individually. Instead, let us connect our purpose, our life purpose to the vision and passion of God. Number two, let us empower believers or let us be empowered to fulfill the Great Commission. Number three, let us engage in action to fulfill the Great Commission. And number four, reap a worldwide harvest of souls for the Lord. May the Lord's word will not fall on deaf ears, but instead will be firmly planted and will bear much fruit in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God, for reminding us today of what your vision and passion is. 
Because, Lord, the same vision and passion that you have, you have entrusted to us to fulfill. Lord, we pray that your words will not be in vain in our hearts. But everything that we have heard here from you, Lord, we will put into practice. And this time we will no longer delay, we will not just watch from the sidelines, but we will roll up our sleeves, get our hands dirty, and just bring it on. Bring it on, Lord. The soldiers of the cross, we will rise up and we will conquer the frontiers. Jesus.